Hello everyone. Guess where I am, not where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> we're out here at Javana and we're talking a little bit about differences in our practice from one to the other. So first things first, when it comes to how like in Catholic you get, like with the Catholic elements, how much would you say that impacts what you do? Mm -hmm. So one of the most common questions I will get is how can I be an Italian or Italian American folk practitioner and not have religion a part of it? Unfortunately, due to the historical context of where this practice comes from, it is nearly impossible to separate it if you want to be practicing true folk magic. If you want to go into, say, something like a paganistic practice, or if you're working with different kinds of gods and deities, then it's very possible. But I shy away from the idea of calling it folk magic at that point and not just calling it, you know, you're practicing whatever the Roman religion of practice that is. No, that, no, that makes a lot of sense. Because for me, it's like, I, I don't call what I do like folk magic unless I'm doing the specific ritual for it. Because otherwise, like what I'm doing is just kind of general witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm not gonna lie, I like some of the new age stuff. Sometimes it's easy to just be like, yep, this thing is moon water in the end and whatever. Mm -hmm. And like, with certain things I'll pull from folk magic, like I know for some reason, in my, like, Cunningham's book, he, he has daisies as, like, moon and water. And I'm like, no, in Slovenian practice, this is fire. This is sun. Because yeah. it literally is, like, the sun with the rays coming out. That's what it means. So sometimes I just completely ignore New Age shit and I default to um, my Slovenian mm -hmm. stuff. But for me, I mean, obviously I'm a Christian wish in general. So Catholicism just makes a really easy, like, entry point mm -hmm. into joining the two. Um, and I mean, like... You go to mass, you got holy water, you got candles, you got holy salt. So it's literally just like the missing link between witchcraft and Christianity mm -hmm. that I pull a lot of inspiration out of. I feel like religion and then like witchcraft, which the umbrella term for whatever kind of, be it neo-pagan, new age, mysticism, or even old school, they all are the same thing with just different names and labels attached to them. No, so yeah. like holy water. That's moon water. Right. Crystals. Those are holy, just like the same yeah, stuff. And then, then you're just repackaged. Them, right. And they're like, there are tons of saints too, like Catholic saints. Like again, Hildegard von Bingen literally mm -hmm. wrote a whole book of stones about like, yeah, these are charged with like the literal power and beauty of God. Yep. Like, so when you got saints like that saying stuff literally a thousand years ago, it's kind of goofy when people are like, these can't go together because it's like, they always have. Yes, they, all, they, they always, they have. always it's the, it's a coin, it's two sides of the same coin. Right. So like, to try and separate religion out of folk magic, for those, if they are, if they have experienced extreme religious trauma, I 100% respect and mm. understand why you don't want to invite that into your sacred safe space. Obviously. However, one of my favorite things that I have found is also taking the power back from a religious institution who has done such right. pain and hurt exactly, and crime yeah. and turning it into something beautiful that promotes tranquility, working with the earth, everything that the church is opposite right. to and getting back to the roots that Catholicism and Christianity originally did promote is a power in itself. Yeah, and that's that's kind of like part of why when people ask me like, why do you call yourself a Christian witch and not like a healer or a mystic? Or well, it's because I'm purposely inserting this really charged um, and I guess counterintuitive language into it mm -hmm. because I'm at the point where I am aggressively taking back this Christian idea. Yeah. Like I'm like, nope, we're gonna combine this with the ikigaki and you're gonna like it because that's what Christianity literally did in yep. the beginning. It yep. said all the things that you think are not correct and like. Whatever, we're going to do it. Like, Christianity was a society-breaking system. They didn't mm -hmm. want... Paul, especially, was like, don't bother getting married. Don't bother having kids. There was so much stuff in early Christianity about, like, well, who cares what society wants? We're going to do what we're going to do because mm -hmm. we have God. So, like, I'm just doing the same thing in a mm -hmm. different font, and people act like what I'm doing is, I don't know, outside the bounds of that history. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, this is perfectly in line with the wacky stuff yep. Christians did. And it's you have... The biggest thing, too, is a religious institution and a religion itself are two separate things. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like once you get institute, once you get rules and leaders, 
and power structures involved, it falls apart no matter yes. how good it started. Yes. So that's kind of what happened here. Once it became like the fashionable religion of the Roman Empire, it was over. Yeah. It was done. So It became, because like there were literally times, I forget what Roman Emperor it was, was like, God, the Christian God, if you help me win this it was, war. Oh yeah, it's Constantine. Yeah, you've yep. helped me win this war, I will convert. And the motherfucker won, and he said, full, whole, hard, Jesus, everything, let's yeah. go! And, like, and even then, like, it wasn't day and night, but it was, like, the For royal him, family. For him, it and then... was what was important, and because it was fashionable, because the royal family took it upon themselves, other people were like, oh, what's going on over there? Give yeah. me a taste of that. Right, and so then, like, uh, eventually everybody, but it was, again, like, people act like it was this violent conversion, like, the, the Iron Curtain fell or something, and it's like, no, it was gradual over time, and that's how so many things got syncretized in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how so many, like, elements of Roman paganism ended up becoming in Roman Catholicism. Oh, yeah, I and mean, those elements, again, are integral to Italian folk practices, mm. at least for, for my practices, because... You'll be doing, like, a novena or something, and you'll be calling upon this specific spirit or the certain language that you're using, and you're like, this sounds very similar or very reminiscent to what ancient Roman practices would also do. Yep. Yeah. I mean, even, like, and it's so funny, like, from a strictly Christian perspective, you look at the Gospel of Mark, and the way they describe Jesus performing his miracles is exactly the same, like, language and form and literary style as, like, the Greek magical papyri. Mm -hmm. So it's like, hi, um, who wrote this and for what audience? Because mm -hmm. this is very obviously, like, Greek magic, but, like, yep. Jesus was doing it. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. For me, in my practice, it's not, like, any one specific... Like, I'll draw on Slovenia wherever I can, but for me, it's very general, like, Christian and just me kind of going at it like on the fly mm -hmm. so like i i know about folk magic enough i know some uh like how and that's my thing i try to find out how it works yeah so that i can break it down and remake it myself mm -hmm. um i don't really like the idea of just like finding specific spells and like just remembering them and doing them over again yeah. i want to break down how they work so i could recreate where, them whenever. because that's true if you don't understand where the power is mm -hmm. coming from where the history for why the specific spell was used, how are you going to make it work? Right. You need to understand the history and the background of things in order to truly give it that oomph that you're looking for. Yeah. If you just look something up off of, like, witchy Wikipedia and be like, salt, herb, ta-da! Right. It's going to be a lot harder to get the result you're looking for. Well, and also, like, a lot, I noticed, like, a lot of, especially beginning witches, like, they get discouraged because, you know, these spells are like, you need this specific ingredient in that specific thing, mm -hmm. and, like, they don't know how to replace it. Yep, or it, substitute it. Yeah. And then also there's this idea that, like, without any tools, you can't do the magic. And it's like, no, 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 your magic's not coming from the shiny rock, yep. okay? Yep, Like, yep. it helps. It can organize your magic a little bit. It can contribute a little bit, but, like, you're the one doing the magic. Mm -hmm. so. And I feel like that's one of the unfortunate issues with New Age witchcraft and New Age occultism. There is so much capitalistic emphasis yep. on products. If you get this specific stone, your whole life is going to change. So spend that $150 in order to get it. When in truth, it's like the stone is not what's doing the work. It's the intention behind it. Now, granted, putting a monetary intention towards something you're going to have that gut feeling that, God damn, this better work. Right, Because yeah. it's an investment. So that does help. But that specific item in general is not what is making the practice more helpful. Right. And it also, like, ignores, um, like, the point of witchcraft to begin with. The reason the witch aesthetic is what it is with the cauldron mm -hmm. and, like, all this stuff is because that's what the witches had. Yep. So it's, like, if you can go out into your backyard and find, like, this clover, to this white little fluffy flower says to you, hey, I'm really good for, like purity and peace mm -hmm. and whatever take it like that's what you got use it you know there's there's no need to spend all this money on stuff mm -hmm. when like your cauldron is now your stainless steel pot go mm -hmm. ahead and boil something in it and there you go so there's definitely a lot of like de-influencing that needs to happen of witchcraft mm -hmm. because it's so overloaded with like the aesthetics like where's the actual magic yes and the other trailers too you are going to get different correspondence from a million different places because yep. that ties into the history of where that item was used yep. from. Exactly. It can have overlapping correspondence, but I'd say also think why it's so important to connect with your heritage because the way your ancestors used a certain item is going to have different connotations than someone on the other side of the world. 
who may have a more bigger, beautiful platform, and they're like, this is how I do things, and it works for me. Fantastic. It right. probably does, no doubt. But that does not mean it's going to give you the strongest results because you are not utilizing all that groundwork that your ancestors were able to put in. Exactly. No, and that's why I was like, um, the chamomile is like the best example I got. Because I'm mm -hmm. like, what do you mean moon water? Because like, when I hold the chamomile, that big, fat, yellow daisy thing, I'm like, this is all sunshine and mm -hmm. optimism and like luck. Like, that's what this is about. That's health. That's that's resurgence. Yeah, radiance that's, and all that. Yeah. That's all that kind of like you're curing and, and revitalizing stuff where it's like, it can have some connection to the moon because it has its feminine properties, but like... It's yellow, <laughs> yeah, right? Like, come on. Like, so, I mean, and this is another thing. Again, application. So, some people will be like, "Where did you get the correspondences of like the fish that you're using?" And I'm like, literally, I will just look up folklore of like an animal and mm -hmm. be like, "Okay, this makes sense." Or like eggplant. I can never find eggplant in any of my kitchen witch books. So I looked at it. I'm like, "Well, it's purple, looks and like a dick. looks like a dick. It's a nightshade." And it's got this very airy body. So to me, this is Jupiter. This is air. This is psychic power. This is uh, royalty, fertility. Like, this mm -hmm. is a lot of different things. And, like, I just got that by looking at it and mm -hmm. patting it a little bit. I'm like, yep, that, that's, a, that's a... You can fit a lot of food yeah. in that. So. And that's a perfect example of building a relationship with an ally. That's mm -hmm. what animism really boils down to is, like, yes, there could be all of these background correspondence, but you have to remember what was useful and made sense mm -hmm. you know 150 years ago may not be applicable to what you have today and so you still have to be able to have that flexibility of coming up with your own interpretations yeah. obviously it's different than being like hey that's a cultural thing that's mine now and it means this right. not the same context however if you are working with just a universal item like an eggplant you can come up with your own mystical reasons for what it does and why it does that yeah no and then this is like again you can buy like herbalism books until you run out of money and mm -hmm. they still won't cover everything because yep. you can't cover everything so it's like at some point you just have to you just have to figure it out you just mm -hmm. have to like if i'm if you're telling me that a lemon is water-based like okay i can see that um it could also if you looked at it be fire-based if you look because oranges are fire mm-hmm Lemon is water, orange is fire. And I'm like, but y'all both have the colors of fire in you. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, it entirely depends. Um, and like, everything can help, right? Like, everything mm -hmm. can help somehow. You have to, again, think about the qualities of the item that you're using. Yes. So lemons, people do lemon hexes because you can. I mean, if you get a cut and you get lemon juice on it, it hurts. Like that a hurts, yep. Bastard. But there's probably not going to be as helpful as like an onion. Onions mm. are culturally, across many cultures, known to be scaring away evil with their stink and they're just like they grow in the ground and in the ground is where like all the chthonic spirits are mm -hmm. um there's folklore that says like the devil when he walks onions and garlic spring up in his footsteps so like oh that's so cool because then you can ap apply it to say so if that where does that tradition come from i think like there's i think it's actually um a muslim folktale that's so, really cool yeah so when if you put that into context of say like and in an American folk practice, you have a lot of onion grass. Mm. Onion grass pops up out of nowhere, and it's really bad for the digestive tracts of most, you know, cloven-hoofed animals. Mm. So they avoid eating it. So you could say that technically the simple onion grass that is literally in your yard right now could be used as a ward for protection and all different kinds of elements. But I am coming to that conclusion on my own just by having this conversation. So that's what makes it so invaluable to have background knowledge and then put it into context of what you're using it for. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I just, I feel like um, a lot of, I feel like there's an element of learned helplessness mm -hmm. with witchcraft. I feel like a lot of people are looking for someone else to tell them because they feel like they can't because they feel like they'll mess it up and then mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. But it's like, no, literally treat magic like science. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, we don't want we want to learn enough that we're not coming to the test tubes mixing together things that are going to blow up. Don't make but, mustard gas. Yeah, spiritual <laughs> mustard gas is a real thing. That's what, that's why I'm saying like, you don't step step one uh, of chemistry start mixing things together. But once you know enough, you can start to experiment and you can start to see like. Will this have a reaction? I don't mm -hmm. know. And you got lab safety and you got all that. So like you can do that after you learn to an extent. 
but you can't have someone else show you how to do your experiments forever or else you're not doing anything new. Mm -hmm. And everyone's experience is personal to themselves. There can be cultural similarities. Like I know that Italian Italian folk magic and Hispanic folk magic are very simil similar, so similar. There's a lot of correspondence where I'm like, oh my gosh, we do the exact same thing. However, in the context of the history and of my personal experience, it's going to be very different than, say, like, my Latino friend who's over there doing br brujeria and stuff like mm. that. Yeah, no, I mean, this is... And, like, again, I don't get super deep into the actual folk magic, um, but I do know that, like, when I'm especially dealing with the hardcore Catholicism stuff, mm -hmm. it's easier for me to, like, I don't know, connect with a lot of Christians who, mm -hmm. like, especially charismatic Christians. Mm. Charismatic Christians are very funny to me because um, they're like, this is devilry, but then they're like laying on hands healing, speaking, and they're getting messages from God directly, you know? And I'm like, guys, what if I took the thing that I'm doing and I called it, and I called it, um, you know, blessings with yep. incorporating creation? Y'all would eat it up. So it's kind of mm -hmm. like... Prayers and rituals... And spells, to me, are synonymous. Well, because you gotta remember that, like, before we had science as we have it now, mm -hmm. religion could not be operated without magic. Mm -hmm. Like, you, how do you talk to your god? Do you need to use magic? How do you um, get a request answered? You have to, this is magic. Mm -hmm. Like, they, that's what it was. You couldn't really do your, any religion without magic, even if you wanted to call it miracle and be like, a nerd about it yeah sure but like it's the same idea mm -hmm. and like i know in like my folk practices a lot of the rituals that you're utilizing have prayers that are completely catholic based oh yeah or you're calling upon spirits that only really came into the world and the stories that we know them because of their catholic faith yep and they're they're so intertwined, it almost, it, it hurts to hear when people, like, I don't want the religious aspect of it. And I'm like, I totally respect your choice. However, when you come to it through a folk practice lens, as opposed to a religious institution, yo, it's yeah. so much better. It Because you can then, you can use your own critical thinking to determine that over there is bullshit. And I don't want to do that, but I can still have a relationship with God. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of like, I mean, that's what my whole thing is about, where it's just kind of like, have you, tr have, have you tried calling God? <laughs> have you tried actually ringing him up, or are you just assuming things based on what you've been told? Um, it's like the people coming to your door and being like, have you talked to God recently? Yes. It's like, well, actually. He has. <laughs> and, you know, we are, we, we vibing. We doing good. <laughs> and it's, yeah, no, but this is why, like, I... I feel, like, heartbroken for people because they'll be like, I don't know, I think God might be angry. And I'm like, have you asked? So I'll be like, let's ask right now. Mm -hmm. Like, and God's like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So, And I it's don't... like that, and unfortunately, religion is used as a major tactic for fear-mongering. It's used as a way to keep people afraid. It's a way to control them and put them in positions where they feel like they have no self-autonomy. Right. So then they can be abused and used by someone in power. To me, folk magic takes that power back. It takes the power away from a religious institution or away from a corrupt religious leader and gives me the power to know that I can talk to God through my own experiences and I can fight back and not sit there and be simply abused and degraded and turned into a tool for someone else to use. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this is, again, this is why, like, the term witch is so political. Mm -hmm. um, there was a part in 1 Corinthians where Paul is saying, like, oh, God uses the foolish to shame the wise. He uses the weak to shame the strong. And I'm like, I'm just kind of adding on to Paul. I'm like, God uses the witch to shame the priest. Ooh, like, I love like, that! He, he absolutely uses the one who's doing bad religion to shame the ones who are so up their own butts about good religion. Mm -hmm. So, like... At the end of the day, um, when things get too institutional, God leaves. That's what I notice if you actually look at the history. of When things get too uh, all about like how to act and not how to be, he's out. He's like, okay, hold on. Y'all lost the plot. Um, no, I believe that because it's like when I go into a church, beautiful church, and it's dead silent and people are just in there on their own praying on their own time, I feel at peace and at calm with my mm. faith. The second that I am listening to a sermon 
from a priest who I, it becomes political. I disagree with so much of the language that they're using, the fear mongering that they begin to implement onto their congregation. And then they wrap it all up being like, thank you, please donate. Yeah, I instantly, I'm like, I feel no faith here. There is no God in this room. There is just a dude on a podium just hanging on his high yeah. horse. No, and this is like at Easter, my mom was like, let's go to Easter Mass. We haven't done that in so long. So I was like, you know what? Sure, let's go. Um, and we, we actually went to a Polish church to get our food blessed. Like, that's a very big Slavic thing. You, on Easter, you take the food and you get it blessed and like sprinkled with holy water. Mm -hmm. So your babka gets a little soggy, but whatever. <laughs> um, and so... We did that, and that was nice, um, but then we went to a church for the sermon, and she she just leaned over, she's like, something didn't feel right. She's like, something is incorrect. And so I'm, like, asking God the whole time this guy's talking. The priest was great. The priest was fine. He pulled up the hungry caterpillar for the homily, and it was, it was very cute. But, like, the people were just, <laughs> it was very, I was like, what is happening? But he, the, the, the people were just following motions. They were just mm -hmm. going through the motions, going for the appearance. Yep, I'm very holy because I went to church, and God mm -hmm. was like, none of these people are here for me. And I'm like... Yep. Oopsie doopsie. No, I believe that. <laughs> I know for a fact that all the times I was dragged to church as a kid, I was sitting there being like, just literally thinking about my favorite TV show at the time, or like hanging with my stuffed animal, mm. just being like trying my darndest to shut up and just sit there and take it. I wasn't there because I wanted to be. Yeah, same. I didn't care. I did not give a shit. I was a small child. You know, who cares? Like, it's like, uh, this is why I stopped going to church. Because, not because, like, I was traumatized or whatever. Because literally, I was like, this is so boring. Mm -hmm. Like, this is so boring. If you, it's like, what's the point of going to a place of faith and religion if you don't feel either of those things? Yeah, if you can't, if you, especially, like, I don't know, kids is like, they're not old enough to appreciate it. So no. why are you dragging them here? I feel what like. What are you doing? Mm -mm. No, if you, if you, and, you know, everyone has their opinion and option at raising their children however they want which is unfortunate but with this i never understood the idea of bringing like babies and stuff to church yeah. if you don't have a caregiver or something that's different but if you are bringing your kids who are old enough to have the autonomy and choice where they can say i'd like to stay at home instead i personally would say go ahead because if they ever find faith, mm. it will not be because it's forced on them. Right. It will be because they find it in their own way. Yeah, no, and no, this is, like, my thing. Like, I just had, like, a total, like, I don't know, boycott of all things church. Just because, like, I got to a point, I don't know if you were felt this, but I got to a point where people, like, said the name of Jesus near me. I just felt, like, cringing. Because, like, it was fine when I was talking about Jesus. It was fine when I was talking about God. But the second anyone else started talking about God and Jesus, I just got the ick, like, so bad. I just got so annoyed because my mom would be such a pain in the ass about the whole, like, you can't wear jeans while there's a family of ten walking into church with jeans on. And I'm like, she's old school Catholic, so I get it. But at the same time, we live in the South. I don't, it just, it, it, the correlation, it's not, it's not a Latin mass, like, it doesn't matter. No, yeah, I mean, like, and the same thing, like, even, I was in Slovenia going to, like, Brezio, which is a world-famous church, and people were still in there with, like, jeans and jacket. I was the only one that had one of these on, mm -hmm. and so it was just, like... No, I love, like, I love now when I go to, like, if I go visit church with my nonna or something, I love wearing my veil, I'm like... Yeah, it's kind of nice, it's kind of, it's kind of, I, I know, feel, I'm like, and again, and I'll be, and I'll be completely forward, I like wearing my veil, because it's an aesthetic choice. Mm -hmm. I feel more like myself. I feel like when I put it on, I am getting into that mindset of like, I am here to do something of importance that's outside of myself. And I really only go to church for like special occasions. And even then, because of my folk practice, it's gotten to the point where I'm like, fuck it, I'll just do it at home. Mm. I have the tools and resources to be able to use my ancestral's practice and what the Catholic Church has available online for free, rather than wasting money on gas right. and with smelly people, I'll just do it at home. And it honestly feels so much more powerful doing it on my own sacred space. Oh yeah, and this is why I started doing my sermons too, because I'm like, church just does not hit, right? Like, you gotta go research the church, you gotta go mm -hmm. there, you gotta listen to them, you gotta be like, are you a good priest, or are you a stupid priest? Mm -hmm. and or then, like, the families and the climate yeah. of who goes and, like, there. Yeah, right, you talk to the people, and they just give you a weird vibe, like, no, screw all that. That's why I'm like, you know what, I'll just preach my own damn sermons, because, mm -hmm. like, 
uselessness. But um, for me also, like, I like to wear this thing because um, for me it's like an energy shield. Because mm-hmm. I get overwhelmed very easily in public. Like, I go, I'm in a grocery store for more than 10 minutes and I start losing my mind. So I wear one of these when I'm going to, like, church. Um, sometimes even when I'm just going out to a new place. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, does it get people's attention? Yes, because they don't see people wear it that much. But for me, it's like... This is like a, almost like a little helmet, like a little spiritual mm-hmm. helmet. And so I'm just kind of like going outside with my helmet on. And I'm like, I am not going to deal with all your energy in my face right now. Yep. And to me, that's my braid. When I braid my hair, I put it up in a bun. I, I use specific sprays. When I'm brushing it, I'm putting specific intentions into it. And when I'm braiding it, I am, to me, it feels like trapping that good energy that I have of my home. And I won't release the braid until I return mm. home. So, because especially in Italian folk magic, hair is vital. It is, especially for women, a major tag lock that traditionally what women would do is when they go get their hair cut, they would take it home with them and keep it in a bag because they did not want any other woman, any other man, anyone using it to try and use it to hex them Mm. or do any kind of bad magic. So the hair was extremely vital because it's literally part of your life force. Right. And so this is actually, um, I was about to ask like, uh, about, you know, hair and stuff. Because in Slavic paganism, um, which kind of made it very easy to carry over into the Orthodox and Catholic traditions, hair was super, super important. A uh, woman's hair, like, it was believed that all of her feminine energy was held in her hair. Mm-hmm. And so when you are not married, you will braid it and you will kind of keep it, like, organized and out of the way. When you are married, you cover your hair. Because it's thought that you only share that with your husband and your family. You, if you're just going outside hair uncovered while you're married, you're just giving away that energy for free. Mm-hmm. So people would look at you very sideways if you went out uh, as a married woman without your hair covered. Um, and then, of course, Christianity came and it was a very seamless transition to like covering hair for modesty reasons. Mm-hmm. But it was originally about safeguarding that energy and mm-hmm. making sure that not just any old schmo can get access to it. Mm-hmm. 